Hey, everybody. Uh, so I've watched all the Disney sequels, all the animated sequels that Disney has ever made. And today, you're going to get to know exactly what it's like to watch a man talk about all those movies. I don't have anything else to say. I don't have any sort of bullshit to get us started with. Let's just get grinding on some sequels, baby. Atlantis 2, Milo's Return, is truly one of the most horrible, difficult to watch movies I've ever seen in my life. All the characters who were kind of endearing in the first Atlantis are extremely boring now. Jeez, I missed you guys. Ah! But why are you here? It's not funny at all, and it also isn't even really a movie. The film is broken into three entirely separate cartoons, and its obvious purpose is to segue into some kind of Atlantis cartoon series. And you can really feel it in this one. There's just a deep sense of apathy in the film, in its sound effects, in the way the characters talk, in this new lava dog. <laughs> A question I have to ask myself as I enter this project is, how exactly am I supposed to judge a movie that exists only to be trash for five-year-olds? Does it really make sense to tear into a film that in a very real way is not a film? And the only answer I can come to, the only answer that makes sense for this video, is yes. I will be judging all of these movies according to the standards of a 27-year-old adult man, and that's how it's gotta be. Atlantis 2 is a filthy movie. I hate this endless joke where Milo explains to Kida what glass does. It's for protection. I know what the spear is for, but why is it in a glass case? Now, the glass case is for protection. Wouldn't the spear be better protection than a glass case? Yes. No. It's there to protect from someone who might want to steal it. Why would someone want to steal a glass case? And uh, that's all I gotta say. Who wants to show me around the city? Oh, let me. I will do it. No, I saw her. Oh, no, me, me. Boys, me. boys, you're both pretty. We'll all go. So, Lion King 1.5 is, I guess, an all-around good Disney sequel. I saw it as a kid and thought it was fine, and then grew up and watched it again and also thought it was fine. It's just Timon and Puma vibing and having a nice time, and that's cute. They make love with one another, they sing sunrise, sunset. <laughs> Marge is in the movie. All you have to do is watch for hyenas and yell if you see one. It's really cool. One thing I quite enjoy in the film is this scene where Pumbaa gets into a little tiny bed. Anthropomorphic characters circling their beds like normal animals is, to me, one of the cutest things that's even around right now, and I enjoy it each and every time I see it. Other than that, I don't got much to say. It's a pretty dope movie, though, and I think Timon Stans will have quite a time with this one. Ariel's Beginning is a sequel to The Little Mermaid, and it's honestly pretty average. Classic 3 out of 10 film, Ariel's Beginning. I will say this, though. The film suffers from one of the absolute worst problems that a prequel can, in that it essentially just reproduces the conflict of the original film. Triton, the king of the sea, used to be happy and love music until his wife died. Athena! After that, he banned all music from his kingdom and started to be an authoritarian parent. The resolving of this conflict, then, involves the softening of Triton's heart, him realizing he should be nice to his daughter and let her do fun things. I hereby decree that music will once again ring clear from one end of my kingdom to the other. You can see the problem here, right? Triton is going to realize his error, start being a good father to Ariel, and then, a few years will pass, Ariel will develop an affinity for land, and he'll just be an asshole to her all over again. It just makes the film proper feel sad, like Triton will never truly overcome his demons, that he will wrestle with his desire to control his daughters until the day he dies. Another problem I have with this plot is that I tire of prequels that feel their only role is to provide psychological justifications for mean characters. At the beginning of the film, Triton's wife was killed by a ship, and this is obviously meant to suggest that he's now like 
bigoted against land or something. I hate that. I don't think that's good. Triton is motivated enough in the original film. He doesn't want to give his daughter freedom. He doesn't want to see her leave him. We don't need a tragic boat thing that actually informed the whole movie. It doesn't add anything. 101 Dalmatians 2 is a pretty boring movie. It's about a little doggy, which is pretty cool, but besides that, it's lackluster. I get into the plot here, but it's genuinely not worth talking about. It's a little doggy adventure movie, and it's fine. That is, except for the Cruella plot in this movie, which is great and makes the entire thing worthwhile. So after the first film, Cruella is left defeated and searching for meaning in her life. But then, she stumbles into an art studio and sees a painting, a black dot on a white canvas, and she's in love. The culmination of all I've ever wished for but could not grasp! <laughs> she meets the cute artist and becomes his patron and greatest admirer. It makes me smile a lot. <laughs> but then, she just hates all of his work. Like he paints black dot after black dot after black dot, and she rejects all of them, feeling they don't evoke a Dalmatian enough. So already, I love this. This painting she saw at the beginning of the film changed her life, brought her such joy, but then she rejects the very thing she loved, destroys the entire reason she's here. The drive to represent Dalmatians consumes Cruella, yet the object of her desire, art that truly represents the world, is always out of reach. I like that, that's great. But then, it gets better. Right toward the end of the film, Cruella de Vil says this line. Oh well, if I can't have a masterpiece, at least I'll finally have a fabulous Dalmatian coat. That's almost as good, don't you agree? And how crazy is that? The entire purpose of this artistic project was to evoke a Dalmatian, give Cruella the ability to experience the joy of these animals without having them. But at the end, the roles are reversed. Cruella needs abstraction, needs these polka-dotted canvases, and failing that, she will settle for the thing itself, for a Dalmatian. W wonderful. Thank you. Also, Jason Alexander plays an evil corgi in this movie, and I really enjoy watching him scheme and hatch devious plans. You're no hero! You're a fraud! Bambi 2 is interesting among all these Disney sequels because it's the only true follow-up to a Golden Age Disney film. I mean, yeah, there's Fantasia 2000, but it only kind of counts. And watching this film, I couldn't help but find it... kind of pitiful? Good morning. <laughs> Awful in a way that none of these other Disney sequels are. Bambi, the 1942 Bambi, is an extraordinary movie, I think one of my favorites. And it's great both because of what it has and what it doesn't have. Bambi doesn't have an overarching plot, it's mostly just a series of largely disconnected scenes. And it doesn't really have characters either. While Bambi is in the movie, there's nothing particularly notable about him. He stopped and looked at me. Yes. I know. He doesn't want anything, he doesn't have opinions, he doesn't have relationships that change. He is largely an anchor through which we experience the world. And that's what the movie's about, nature, its beauty and terror and death and fecundity. Bambi 2 is Lion King. It's about Bambi getting to know his estranged prince father after his mother dies. And it just feels, at every moment, like it's trying to copy the relationship between Mufasa and Simba. Listen. And smell. All at the same time. There's a scene that feels like I just can't wait to be king. There's a scene that feels like Mufasa confronting Simba after he goes to the elephant graveyard. What if I hadn't gotten there in time? You could have been... When I tell you to run, you run! Never freeze like that! The vibes are unmistakable. That's lame, obviously. There's no real purpose to the movie, and it's boring and reminiscent. But more than that, the movie just works to remind me that Disney just can't make movies like Bambi anymore, that there's no place for that kind of thing now. Bambi in Bambi 2 is a spunky little guy. Blech, blech. His father is stern, but we grow to love him. But Bambi! A prince does not woo who. 
Syrupy music floods the film, telling us exactly how to feel at every moment. It all has to be literal and narrative and direct. Hey, where's everybody going? Forced on fire? Golden Age Disney films, not just Bambi, but also Pinocchio and Snow White and Dumbo to some extent, all have this incredible energy to them. Like you're in a strange dream, and the world is ambiguous and fuzzy, yet unsentimental, somehow abstract. I like movies like that, I like Bambi, and I just don't know what the point is in making a sequel that couldn't care less about the energy of the original film. Peter Pan 2 Return to Neverland is one of the only Disney sequels I actually saw as a kid. It was theatrically released and it shows. The movie is more polished than other sequels are. It's more like a normal film and not a strange bootleg version of the original. Ow! That said, I don't enjoy it that much. Like, it works, it works fine. The film's angle that Jane, Wendy's child, is traumatized by war into feeling like she must be an adult until she meets the sexy Peter Pan is clever, and the film treats that plot with the seriousness that it deserves. Tell him Peter Pan stories. He needs them, Jane, and so do you. Please, dear, promise me. No! I will not promise! But there is something generic about the movie, and I'm not totally sure what I get from it or what it's here to do. There is one scene in the film, though, that I keep coming back to, and it happens right at the end. Peter Pan drops Jane off at her mother's, Wendy's, house, and so he gets to see Wendy again for a brief moment. He seems almost horrified by her, the fact that she's gotten older, lost her childishness, and she reassures him that nothing really has changed. You changed? Not really. How sad is that? What a weirdly resonant moment. Like, Wendy has changed. She's an adult now, a mother and a wife. She lives during a world war and is about to send her children away from London to avoid the bombs dropping on her city. She's an adult and that was the choice she made. Peter Pan is the one who chose to live in a fantasy, who turns away from meaningful and at times very dark reality. <laughs> And so, this scene almost makes me feel like Wendy's placating Peter, telling him what he needs to hear. That the world is like Neverland, that she has, like him, lived in stasis for the last 20 some odd years. There's a tragedy to this scene, and while I'm not sure the film totally picks up on that, I think it's kind of beautiful and an extremely melancholic way to end the film. I don't know what the point of this sequel is, really, but this one scene has a reason to exist, and so I'm happy it does. Mulan 2 is a movie that's kind of broken in half for me. Some of it's great, some of it's bad, uh, so let's start with the bad. I don't love the plot of this movie. Mulan and her sexy BF are ordered by the Emperor to deliver his daughters to their arranged marriages to various nobles. This, the Emperor believes, will make China a unified front against the Mongolians and prevent a massive war. We will forge a union so strong the Mongol hordes won't dare attack. An alliance with the kingdom of Qigong. The conflict, though, is that Mulan is against arranged marriages and believes you should follow your heart to the one you love. They will marry Lord Qin's son what? and... Your Majesty... An arranged marriage? So, I think this is kinda stupid, though maybe that's for pedantic reasons. The idea that Mulan, this adult woman living in feudal China, would be so scandalized by the concept of arranged marriage among noblemen seems really odd to me. And the whole movie, I just find myself wanting her to get some perspective here. The Emperor believes very clearly that this is the only way to prevent a massive war, and Mulan seems completely apathetic about it. She doesn't suggest any alternative, she doesn't seem to care about the Mongolians, she's just really invested in these random women following their hearts. The whole thing is so exciting. We're very happy, really. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It doesn't add up for me, and she doesn't come off as reasonable as the plot clearly thinks she is. 
I hate Mushu in this movie too, performed by this strangely impeccable Eddie Murphy impersonator. <laughs> oh, that did it. His whole plot is him being a weird little asshole, just a weird guy. When Mulan gets married, he'll lose his position among the gods, and so he spends the entire movie sabotaging her relationship. It's mean-spirited and not fun, and the idea that I'm supposed to end the movie liking this guy is preposterous to me. Mushu is a freaky demon. I don't understand how Mulan forgives him. I certainly don't. So what do I like about Mulan 2? Uh, this romance between the three daughters of the Emperor and the three misogynistic freaks who Mulan fought a war with in the first movie. Yeah! I don't even really have much to say about this plot. Watching these ladies fall in love with a bunch of gremlins is extremely good and I love every minute of it. It's incredible. Who's the big boy? Thank you. I also feel I should say that Mulan 2 gave rise to one of the greatest nostalgia critic moments that's ever been created where Doug Walker furiously says this. This movie is called Mulan 2 The Final War. WHERE'S THE FINAL WAR?! WHERE'S THE FINAL WAR?! Very good, Doug. Pocahontas is kind of unique within the world of straight-to-VHS Disney sequels because it's the one film in this category that I think deserved to be made, at least on some level. Pocahontas, the real person, did return to England and meet the king. That's a fascinating story, and there's something to telling it, a reason for this to exist. And the result is, well, it's interesting. It's a weird movie. I really like the way Pocahontas uses white powder to disguise her race. It feels oddly direct as a statement about colonizers and their impact on the colonized, and I really didn't see it coming. I enjoyed this ridiculous love triangle where John Rolfe and John Smith, two characters who are written in almost the exact same way, have to vie for the affections of Pocahontas. All that matters is that we're together again. They obviously did this because the real-life Pocahontas married Rolf, not Smith, so they felt like they had to get that right in the sequel. But that's kind of shocking, right? That they cared more about historical accuracy in garbage Pocahontas than they did in the original? By far, the weirdest thing about the movie, though, is its ending. So, the whole movie is about Pocahontas trying to get an audience with King James so she can tell him not to invade America. He believes there's gold there because of the scheme Governor Ratcliffe. The chief will only tell you more heathen lies. War is the only way. At the end of the movie, of course, Pocahontas has her say and manages to talk to the king, and his wife, Anne, says this. There is no gold, is there? I thought about making an entire video out of the line, there is no gold, is there, because it's so shocking to me on so many levels. For one, it's a lie. No, Virginia is not known for gold mining. You're not going to find lots of gold there. But there is gold to be made in Virginia, in its land and crops, and in the subjugations of the Indians who lived there. We know this, actually, because King James and England did colonize America and did get value from it. This is obviously just a historical fantasy, like the original film was, though maybe more pernicious than that. Just be nice to the hapless white people, the movie says. Just tell them you'd rather not die, and it'll all work out great. <laughs> But what I find even more striking about this line is the logic that it establishes for us. King James's wife does not say, we shouldn't be doing this, or colonialism is wrong, or people already live there. She says, there is no gold. That is to say, even in the vapid, wish-fulfillment-driven, ahistorical world of Pocahontas, the only real way to convince the British not to kill a bunch of people is to show them that there's no money in it. Which, I think, is really funny and good. The Fox and the Hound 2 is, before anything else, one of the most cursed movies I've ever seen. It takes place right in the middle of The Fox and the Hound 1. 
It's about the puppy copper joining a howling dog band, and I'm kind of confused as to how it even got made. Like, the story centers on the relationship between Copper the dog and Todd the fox. They have a dog band oriented conflict and then become best friends again. You're not around anymore. And it's like, that's fine, but we know how this is gonna end. It doesn't matter how much they say they'll be friends forever, they won't be. The whole movie is haunted by this tragic ending that it refuses to even acknowledge. It's so weird. As far as the movie itself is concerned, it's one of my least favorite Disney sequels simply because it is so outrageously boring. The songs all feel generic and dull, the plot feels padded out, and they don't like make Copper or Todd interesting characters or explore them further in any way. I don't like this one is my point. I don't like Fox and the Hound 2. On First Pass, a goofy movie and its sequel, an extremely goofy movie, look very similar to one another. They're both about the strained relationship between Goofy and his son Max. They're both concerned with Max wanting independence and Goofy wanting to be with him. I'm not gonna be there at college to pick up after you. In fact, it's gonna be a long time before you see your old man again. What? They both resolve with the father and son having a better appreciation for each other but they're not similar movies. The vibes of the sequel are way more strange and disconcerting than the original ever was, and that's for a very simple reason. Max has nothing to learn. He has no actual character arc. Whereas in the original film, Max was genuinely pretty mean to his dad, deceiving him, showing disdain for him and the things he cares about, Max in this movie is just pretty normal. He likes Goofy fine. When it turns out his dad has to attend college with him, Max wants to cut him slack. Good luck, son. Yeah. You too, Dad. And when he sees his father enjoying disco, he thinks it's fun. So it's not that Max disrespects Goofy, it's not that he doesn't show that he cares for him. No, he just wants to be alone sometimes, to be allowed to study and talk to people and play sports and enjoy being at college for the first time. Don't you get it? I'm trying to get away from you. I'm not a little kid anymore. Now just leave me alone and get your own life. And despite the fact that this is an extremely normal request, Goofy won't respect it. He follows Max constantly, tries to do everything Max does, and doesn't seem to care that he obviously hates it. What do you say, boys? Dad, the first class is not till nude. This isn't the conflicted father and son story from the first movie. It's not about two people who both need to learn for and with each other. It's about a dad who simply will not listen to his son. The most obvious place you can see this is in a scene toward the middle of the film where Max manipulates Goofy into playing for another sports team so that he can practice without his dad. The Gammas are the team and they need you more than we do. Oh yeah, Mr. Goof, the Gammas are like way hot, man. In the first movie, when Max lies to Goofy, you feel bad about it. Goofy isn't a perfect father, but you feel like he deserves to be treated better than this. In the new movie, though, all I can think is, good, lie to him. Goofy's clearly not mature enough to deal with anything else. He doesn't want to care about you. So have a good time. Deceive your baby man father. <laughs> I can't believe it. It worked. We unloaded my dad, and now we can focus on winning. And what a strange thought that is to have about Goofy. I love Goofy. My point is, an extremely goofy movie is a kind of depressing film. Don't get me wrong, I like it, it's well animated and funny and probably an A-tier Disney sequel, but when it comes to the characters and their conflicts with each other, it just doesn't feel right. There's not a lot to say about Tarzan and Jane. There's really just one scene I quite enjoyed where Tarzan and some evil diamond miners come upon some beautiful diamonds. Look how happy those boys are. They're really all on the same page in this moment, just enjoying diamonds together. I'm a big fan of this scene in Tarzan and Jane. You know, a lot of criticisms are made of the original Beauty and the Beast. 
that it's abuse apologia, that Bell has Stockholm Syndrome, etc. And whatever you want to think about that criticism, and to be clear, I think it's kind of a shallow one, the actual movie doesn't feel bad. The Beast doesn't feel like an irredeemable abuser, and Bell doesn't seem stupid for loving him. You must go to him. What did you say? I release you. You're no longer my prisoner. You mean... I'm free? And this effect, this lack of nastiness, is able to happen because of one simple thing about the relationship between Belle and the Beast. It's reciprocal. At the beginning of the movie, the two characters both hate each other, then the Beast shows Belle kindness and she responds, and they slowly fall in love. This is essentially the story of most romantic comedies, two characters trapped together and falling in love. And, you know, it works. It feels good. Toward the beginning of The Beauty and the Beast 2, Belle's Enchanted Christmas, Belle sings a song about how she wants to connect with the Beast, get to know him, essentially fall in love with him. I'm sure that when he knows the way And that sounds like it makes sense, but the scene doesn't work. Because here's the thing, for basically the entire movie, the Beast acts like an enormous prick. He insults Belle, doesn't respect her desire to have a nice Christmas. There will be no Christmas. But... No! Throws her in a dungeon because she disobeys him. And because of this, the film is more amenable to criticisms of Beauty and the Beast than the original film ever was. Because this, the way Belle acts in this song and at other points in the movie, it doesn't feel like love, it feels pitiful. It's not reciprocal, it's one-sided and tragic and genuinely kind of hard to watch. What are you hiding? The experience of watching Beauty and the Beast 2 is a complicated one, though. Because on one hand, you have the main plot of the film, this tedious, sad, dull thing. And on the other, you have the villain of the movie, goth Tim Curry CGI Piano. They can't fall in love if they're dead! He's so goth, this man. He loves his goth music so much that he wants to keep the beast sad so that he'll enjoy gloomy organ vibes. The music helps. Music is the only thing that helps me forget. And so, for the entire movie, you just sit there thinking to yourself, when's the goth CGI piano gonna come back? I wanna watch the goth CGI Tim Curry piano again. Humanity is entirely uh -huh. overrated. Before the enchantment, there was no need for my particular brand of genius. It's a movie with 15 minutes of absolute perfection, and the rest of it just exists to haunt you. Also, Bernadette Peters in this movie. That's cool. Mm. As long as there's Christmas, I truly believe. So, there's a few things we could say about The Little Mermaid 2, a movie about Ariel's daughter wanting to enjoy the sea. We could talk about Ursula's crazy sister, a character who apparently always existed, scheming in the background. <laughs> Crazy sister. In fact, the only reason you didn't see Ursula's crazy sister in the original film was that she was too busy helping Ursula, making Ursula's dreams a reality. We could talk about the way Ursula's crazy sister dies, one of the most traumatic death scenes I've ever seen in a Disney movie. She's just frozen now at the bottom of the sea, I guess. That's just where she's gonna be now. But really, the only thing that matters about The Little Mermaid 2 is Flounder, who is, regretfully, an adult now. You're sure not a guppy anymore. <laughs> you could say that again. Some time has passed, and while Ariel still looks exactly the same as she did in the first movie, Flounder is an otaku now. I am obsessed with his character design. I'm obsessed with his voice. I love him so much. Wild seahorses couldn't stop me. Look at him. Look at this fucking man. He's going to help Ariel out, and he's gonna look good while doing it. Let's talk about the hunchback of Notre Dame 2. 
So, I like the plot of this movie. You know, it was always suspicious that Quasimodo didn't end up with anyone at the end of The Hunchback, unlike almost every other Disney protagonist. Like, it's fine to not have a romance in your movie, but in this case, it just felt like the film didn't want to imagine an ugly guy getting a, getting a girl. And in the sequel, you know, he dates someone. He gets himself a little girlfriend. It's really amazing. It's cool. Beyond that, the film just has a lot of frankly iconic things in it that I'm just gonna tell you about now. Like a little positive cinema sins. I like the villain of this movie, Saroosh. Thinking. <laughs> Not your strong suit, is it, my little bonbon? I love a beautiful, dandy, gay villain in a Disney movie. I don't think there's any denying the power of that. And this guy is a beautiful example. He's perfect. I like this animation of Quasi ringing the bell. Look how happy he is. The banality of this hat line and the way Quasi is so delighted by it feels oddly real to me. It looks like you're wearing a really big hat. <laughs> oh, that, that sounds silly, doesn't it? No, I just never looked at it that way before. <laughs> like, people should write their characters just saying dumb shit and vibing about it more often, I think. Phoebus, who is Esmeralda's husband, is a racist in this movie. Like, his arc is about how much he hates travelers and stuff. I don't trust these people. What does that mean? Well, just look at them. It feels like a truly random addition, and I appreciate it. Look, Saroosh is voguing. That's really cool, right? Like, you know, what an amazing choice that is. I love this animation sequence revealing Quasimodo looking fucking hot and sexy. This song between Quasi and his young friend is cute. You mean if ever I'm in any kind of great big mess or trouble? I'd be right there. This gargoyle song is unbelievably good. Whoever wrote the music for this movie deserves an award. He's fa -la 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 fallen in love. Again, I truly appreciate that Madeline just says the most boring lines imaginable and Quasi eats that shit up. You mean hocus there or pocus? Delusion there illusion? <laughs> <laughs> Abra there cadabra? <laughs> Like, I genuinely believe it's cute. There's a debauched romance in this film between this gargoyle and a goat, and frankly, uh, that's good. That's a good thing. Petite chef de mort. <laughs> what are you doing there? Uh, nothing. I enjoy that this movie isn't afraid to show us a statue loving a goat. That's cool to me. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's everything I enjoyed about The Hunchback of Notre Dame 2. What's your favorite thing about The Hunchback of Notre Dame 2? Leave your answers in the comments. As in Emperor's New Groove, Stan, I was wary of the sequel, Kronk's New Groove. It's another one of these not-exactly-a-movie Disney sequels. One where there's just three largely disconnected cartoons that seem obviously intended to segue into some kind of Disney Channel show. And for this reason, I assumed it would be bad and low effort, and not really worthy of my valuable time. I was wrong, though. Kronk's New Groove slaps. It has the same basic vibes as the original film does, it has the same voice actors, and it's really funny. I love Kronk's girlfriend. They have a great dance sequence together. I love the part where everyone in town gets in drag and pretends to be Kronk's wife. She's Mrs. Kronk, and she's Mrs. Kronk. <laughs> no, Poppy, I can explain. I'm the lovely Mrs. Kronk. <laughs> You're stepping on my face! That's great. That's just objectively a, a great thing to have in a movie. Usually, when I watch these sequels, I'm taking a ton of notes because I know that I'm going to be writing about it. But in this case, I just found myself vibing. And so, I'll just leave it at this. If you're a Kronk head, as we all should be, then get a glass of wine and prepare yourself for the night of your fucking life. Prepare yourself to be dazzled. So, Tangled Before Ever After is fine. I like it enough. I'm kind of at a loss, frankly, for what to say about Tangled Before Ever After. It's very much the pilot episode to a cartoon I haven't seen, and it seems to do a good job at being that. I feel, though, that without having seen the rest of the show, I can't truly opine about this movie. How's everything gonna work out, you know? Does Rapunzel's weirdly evil father die? Does he live and kill Rapunzel? I don't know. As of tonight, 
I am forced to exercise my martial right as king to forbid you from leaving the walls of this kingdom without my consent. That's all my thoughts about Tangled before ever after. So, Wrecked Ralph 2, Ralph Breaks the Internet, is, of course, a break in style for us. It was theatrically released. There were obviously people who cared about it. It's a normal animated movie, and it's also just really weird. Ralph Breaks the Internet is about what it sounds like. In order to fix Vanellope's arcade game, she and Ralph have to go to the internet and get money for a new steering wheel. When she gets there, though, Vanellope realizes that she likes life on the internet more than life in the arcade, and Ralph doesn't like that. The second I walked into this game, it felt... Well, it, it felt like home. I mean, more than Sugar Rush ever did. The movie is about letting go, accepting that your friends will change, but the way it approaches this subject matter is just very uncomfortable, and uncomfortable in a way that's hard to put your finger on. In the original film, Ralph roughly assumed the role of Vanellope's father. He took care of her, and he's older than she is, and it just feels vaguely paternal. This is true in the sequel as well, at least to some extent. The plot of the film, watching this young person leaving her small town and going to the big city, is one that obviously evokes a parent dealing with their kid growing up. But the odd thing is that for most of the runtime, Ralph feels more like Vanellope's child than her father. Wanna get rich playing video games? Click here to find out how. Ralph, come on! Look, there's a lot of cool stuff here! It feels like he wants her to care for him, that he's deeply immature, and that she's the only one with any ability to regulate her emotions or deal with the world. It's just not clear what Ralph is supposed to be, what this relationship is exactly, and you can really feel this tension most at the end of the movie. Ralph is the worst. I hate him. Seeing that Vanellope is happier in this new game, Ralph sabotages her, unleashes a virus that feasts on her glitch, her insecurity, and destroys her game. He didn't mean for this to happen, he just wanted to make the game slow and boring so she'd come home, but that's not much of an excuse at all, is it? So here's the question, how are we, as an audience, supposed to interpret these events? If Ralph is an adult, this is a pretty unforgivable act of abuse, right? He is using this person's weakness to control them, convince them that the world is boring and awful, and that he is the only one who can offer a good life. If Ralph is a child, though, as this sequence does kind of evoke, then Ralph just didn't know better. This was a temper tantrum. It'll all be okay. Look, there's you! Oh, yeah. It's really hard to figure out how we're supposed to look at Ralph. I gotta admit, you know, part of me kind of likes this. This feeling of instability or confusion in the central relationship of the film. It's complicated and unique, and it's nice to see weird things in Disney movies. But at the same time, I, I do hate it. Watching this guy who was the kindly protagonist of the first film just become this horrific child-parent hybrid monster is not really what I want out of a Wreck-It Ralph sequel. I just feel like the movie's doing too much here somehow. Okay, getting a little clingy on me here. Come on, get out of here. The other obviously noteworthy thing about Ralph Breaks the Internet is the environment of the film, the internet. And truly, this place is awful. It's unbelievably bad. To see the fun arcade setting of the first movie transition into this, this sterile, clean mall environment, fills me with a kind of dread. Like, I guess the world is just not fun now, according to Disney. Things were colorful and cool, but then the internet happened, and now everything is ugly. Recently, I watched the Dan Olsen video about Decentraland and the Metaverse, these entities trying to construct literal digital places where they can sell land. The video is largely about the inevitable failure of Decentraland, but watching this movie, I, I can't help but think that if this did work, if we were able to turn the internet into a city, it would be the lowest place imaginable. Just the most horrible, empty consumer environment that could ever exist. I hope that Mark Zuckerberg doesn't figure it out, is my point. I hope he's not able to wreck it Ralph 2, Ralph breaks the internet, the entire world. Toward the end of Jungle Book 2, a girl, Mowgli's little friend, talks to Baloo, the bear, and the question on all our minds is, what is even going on anymore? 
You! You! You stay away from me! I always thought Mowgli had some special ability to talk to animals. Just everyone can do it? Everyone can talk to bears? Why do the people in the movie act like bears are so different and scary when they're just very simply uh, little guys you can talk to? The movie's about how Mowgli, now living with humans, has a family who doesn't want him going into the jungle. The jungle is a dangerous place. And by the end, when you see this scene, all you can think is, you know, a conversation would have solved this problem. You'd think Mowgli would tell his adoptive father, can you just talk to the bear please? Can you just communicate with the bear for five seconds? You can talk to bears in this movie. Cinderella 2 is another one of these three cartoons blended together kinds of sequels. I've honestly grown to really resent these movies because it feels like as a reviewer I'm supposed to go over all the separate cartoons and I refuse to do that. I'm not going to be talking about the second cartoon where a mouse turns into an ugly man. I'm not interested in that. What am I doing? <laughs> I'm a man now. The whole framing device for this movie is that it's stories told by mice, and I don't want to hear them most likely lie about how one of them got turned into a guy. I'll just come right out and say it, I'm too pure for that. What I am interested in this movie though is the way it characterizes Cinderella because I think it does a weirdly bad job at that. In the first cartoon, Cinderella has to throw some kind of ball for the castle as her first act as princess. But the conflict is, Cinderella's not like other princesses. Couldn't I just wear one of my own dresses? Oh, how very amusing, your highness. She's a commoner, and she's gonna bring some fun to the castle. So, I don't like this. I don't vibe with this plot. Why is Cinderella acting like she knows best about everything, rejecting the advice of her aide? Wouldn't it be nice if everyone at dinner sat where they liked, she says. Wouldn't it be nice if people could just sit wherever they like? No, Cinderella, it wouldn't. Maybe spend 20 minutes taking in your new surroundings before you rebel against the concept of seating arrangements. Cream or ecru? Um, ecru? Goodness no. Cream. Every Disney princess hates their lives, hates doing royal stuff, but in this case it's like, if you felt so bad about it Cinderella, why did you marry Prince Charming? Why did you even want to go to the ball if you hate royal parties so dang much? You know, my point here is, get over yourself Cinderella, you have a lot of growing up to do. It's simply not the way things are done. Perhaps the time has come to try something new. Another thing of note about this movie is a moment from the third cartoon. This one's about one of Cinderella's stepsisters trying to get a man, and it's, I guess, the best of the three. But the funniest scene happens right at the start of the story, and I'll just play it. I saw you in the baker's shop. Oh, he must think I'm... Oh, he saw it was an accident. Don't give up so fast. What would you know? You're beautiful. It's always been easy for you. Easy? So, I get that Cinderella is supposed to be forgiving and nice, and it makes sense that she'd ultimately want to forgive her stepsister, but that's not what's happening here, right? Rather, the scene just kind of gives the impression that Cinderella doesn't care at all about the way her stepsister treated her, like her mind is completely empty. She hasn't forgiven her sister, there's no scene where that happens, her brain is simply incapable of thought. It's eerie, frankly. Can I just say, I don't understand how attraction works in Brother Bear 2. I don't understand how it is that people become attracted to one another in the film Brother Bear 2. So the movie is a romance about a bear who used to be a man, Kanai, and a woman, Nita. They fall in love, and at the end of the movie, Nita decides to become a bear. And my question is, how does Kanai feel about this development? Like, he used to be a guy, right? Presumably, he was capable of finding Nita, the woman, attractive. So, when she becomes a bear at the end of the movie, is he good with that? Does he want to kiss this bear woman? Is Kanai attracted to bears? For that matter, is Nita attracted to bears? Does she like the way this bear looks? Who exactly in this movie 
is attracted to bears. I'd like to imagine that neither of them are. They just love each other so much that despite the fact that they're both humans who have spent their lives attracted to people, it doesn't matter that they're both now married to a bear. It's kind of sweet, honestly. Anyway, the movie is pretty bad. They fight raccoons, which is wrong because raccoons are good guys. Ow, wow, wow. Nowhere to run to, baby. Nowhere to hide. And that's all I have to say. So, on the theme of me not understanding how attraction works in a Disney sequel, I don't understand how attraction works in Lady and the Tramp 2, Scamp's Adventure. The movie is about a puppy, Scamp, the son of the protagonists of the original film. He wants to leave the domestic life he's come to find stifling, and so he goes on a stray dog adventure and meets a dog girl, Angel. And then, there's a vague love triangle between Scamp, Angel, and a bad boy dog named Buster. Who's the king of the junkyard? Oh, you are Buster. So, here's the problem. Uh, Buster is an adult dog. This is made very clear to us as an audience. And this, this simple fact, leads us to two possible, equally bad scenarios. If Angel is a puppy, then that means Buster is some kind of predator, lusting after a child dog. And if Angel is an adult dog, well, then she's the predator because she's dating the puppy, Scamp. So no matter what, some adult is dating some child in The Lady and the Tramp 2, Scamp's Adventure, and I just felt like I had to say that. One other interesting thing in this movie happens right toward the end. So, Scamp goes on his little adventure, experiences true freedom with a bunch of trash dogs, and then, of course, he decides that living at home is better and that being a pet isn't so bad. Upon seeing this realization, the other dogs he was hanging out with all decide he was right. Living in a house would be good after all. I think a home sounds nice. With lots of children and hugs and kisses. <laughs> I find this moment striking because, like, this is not how stray dogs come into existence, a fact that the movie is very much aware of. Angel, Scamp's lover, was abandoned by five separate households. I always thought one was too many. I could never get one to stick. Someone would take me in. Just when I'd start to think, wow, this is my family, they'd move or have a new baby or have an allergy. Living in the dump wasn't a choice for her, and it wasn't a choice for any of these other dogs. And so, when they decide they'd like to have owners, it's kind of melancholy. Like, cool decision, now what? You're still astray, nobody's opening their houses to you, you're alone in this world regardless of what you choose to believe. One last thing, uh, Lady and the Tramp 2 has one of my favorite animation glitches ever, and I just want to play it now. Do mine eyes deceive me? Hey, Scamp! scamp -a doodle <gasps> You escaped the pound! Yeah! Look at Scamp's dumb, still face. It's so good. There's a lot to appreciate about Cinderella 3, A Twist in Time. The movie is about the evil stepmother harnessing the fairy godmother's magic to make it so that her daughter, Anastasia, can be married to Prince Charming, and there's two things I find really interesting about it. The first is, the film works really well as a prequel to Cinderella 2. Earlier on, when I talked about that movie, I made a point of the fact that Cinderella's relationship to Anastasia makes no sense. Why is Cinderella so fast to help this woman who bullied and demeaned her? Why is there never even a conversation about their relationship? And Cinderella 3, taking place before the second film, actually does attempt to answer that question. Anastasia and Cinderella do have a relationship now. At the end of the movie, Anastasia sacrifices her chance to be with Charming because she sees that it's wrong. This is the real Cinderella. Your true love. It makes sense now why the two of them would like each other. It's a clever bit of writing, and in a sea of Disney films, both remakes and sequels, that try to fix things about their respective movie, I'd say this is a rare case where they actually did a good job. More importantly, I like Cinderella 3 because it is unapologetically a downer of a movie. Its protagonist, its emotional center, is Anastasia, this ugly, awkward woman who just wants to be loved and who lives with a horrible mother. I've given you everything you ever wanted, Anastasia. 
But I want someone to love me for me. And it's brave enough to give that story an unhappy, yet still really satisfying conclusion. By the end of the movie, Anastasia is not in a good position. She has to go back and live with an abusive freak. She doesn't get to marry Prince Charming, even though she genuinely seems to love him. He was nice to me. Oh. <laughs> That's because he's under a spell. He'd have to be to fall for you. It's more than that. It's really quite sad, but there's something so refreshingly real about it. When else in the Disney catalog has there been a movie about an ugly duckling who wanted more and just didn't get it? Who had to figure out a way to live well even if it harms her? It's kind of wild, honestly, that this movie exists. At any rate, I like Cinderella 3. I like Prince Charming, this dumb, kind of cute guy. Thanks. And, uh loved the song. I like the concept of the movie, time travel stuff appeals to me, and I like Anastasia. She's a really well-grounded and interesting character. Ooh. I've already made a pretty bad video about Frozen 2, so I won't get too deep into it. I'll just say, I am a Frozen 2 apologist. It goes hard, Frozen 2. You can't deny that. It's just a very extra kind of movie, and I appreciate that about it. Uh, that's all. <laughs> I think that, arguably more than any of these other movies, Aladdin 2 Return of Jafar justifies the existence of Disney sequels. That's not because it's good. I mean, to be fair, it is a pretty good movie, it has some good songs, it has some funny lines, Dan Castellaneta does a genuinely good job playing Genie. He's big! He's blue! He's back! But more important here than the film's quality is the simple fact that its protagonist is Yago, the annoying bird played by Gilbert Godfrey. Forget about that guy. Forget about the way you fell into his eyes. The movie is about literally nobody else. Aladdin doesn't have a character arc, Jafar doesn't have a character arc, Jasmine is hardly in it. It is exclusively about Yago, a bird learning to be a, a good guy. Hello. Was this choice successful? Do I approve of the concept of this movie? Well, yes, of course I do, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that there is no theoretical other way this film could have been made. There is no alternate path the Yago-led Aladdin script could have taken. It was either going to be a shitty Disney VHS sequel, or it was going to be nothing. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad it's real. I'm glad there's a Yago movie. I'm glad the Disney sequels exist if they brought us a film where Gilbert Godfrey got to scream for 90 minutes straight. That's important to the world somehow. What more do you want? Two notes about Aladdin, King of Thieves. Uh, number one, Aladdin Daddy Sexy, look at him go, hot boy coming through. Number two, I like it when he, a thief and a bandit, says he never hurts the innocent. We never hurt the innocent. I just don't believe him. I think he kills people. I do not believe him. He destroyed his son's wedding after all. Was his son not innocent? I do not believe this man. Fantasia 2000 is, without a doubt, the Disney sequel that is most difficult for me to talk about. It is the one that takes itself the most seriously, and it's the only one that I've seen multiple times just for fun. I've tried approaching this section a number of different ways at this point, but in the end, I think our best way to approach it is to simply go through each of the film's sections. Fantasia 2000 begins with Beethoven's Fifth. <laughs> The short aims for a kind of abstraction, a nod to the way the original film begins. There's a stiffness, though, to the animation here, to the way effects are placed over static, watercolor paintings. For what is supposed to be abstract, the sequence is also notably literal and on the nose. These simplistic bird creatures don't feel evocative, they feel like birds. And the story being told doesn't feel ambiguous or intriguing, it feels like some generic good versus evil thing. There are images in this cartoon that I find beautiful, but all things considered, it kind of feels like a screensaver, and I don't like it very much. The second sequence, The Pines of Rome, a short about a bunch of whales who fly, is one of the most interesting sequences in the film, and that's largely because of its animation. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't look perfect. The CGI bodies of these whales simply 
they do not lend themselves very naturally to expressing dynamic music, and the result is what feels like a short film with an interesting soundtrack, and not a short film about the music, trying to express the music. Still, I enjoy these whales. I love the way their early CGI models look, and I love that the animators manually painted their eyes to make them more expressive. The film is obviously aiming for a prestigious and serious tone, and while these goofy-ass eyes don't convey that tone, I kind of like them for that reason. All in all, I think the Pines of Rome sequence is cool, it's interesting, it's different. Quickly after this point though, the movie takes a turn. The third short uses the composition Rhapsody in Blue. It's based on the artwork of Al Hirschfeld. And to be clear, I think it's probably the best sequence in the entire film. It's cute and fun, the animation is good, it works for what it's trying to accomplish. So I enjoy this cartoon, but I find the way I enjoy it kind of interesting. Put simply, I like it because it tells a fun story. I'm invested in this guy who wants to play drums, and in this girl who wants her parents, and in this hedonistic freak. I want to see where these characters end up. This is all just very literal storytelling. And while it works well enough for this short, what's odd is that the rest of the movie just leans really hard in this direction. The next short is a piece by Shostakovich, a reimagining of the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale, The Steadfast Tin Soldier. And boy, does it suck. The obvious problem with it is the CGI animation, which is in the awkward position of neither being good nor interesting. The characters plainly look bad, a bit like the early Pixar animation Tim Toy, though without its charm. And to be clear, this was 12 years after that short came out. Pixar had already made two Toy Stories and was producing Monsters, Inc. by this time. The more subtle problem here, though, is that we are once again given an extremely direct and on-the-nose story, and I'm not sure why, or why I'm supposed to care about it. The original Fantasia placed its emphasis squarely on the performance of its music. Sure, it had subjects, characters, but for the most part, these subjects were used to convey the music, not the other way around. Now, in this short, I truly feel like I am watching a bad version of the Steadfast Tin Soldier, and I don't like that. Up next is the Carnival of Animals, a yo-yo flamingo sequence. It's quite short and doesn't stick out in my memory well, so I'll just kind of move past it. It's fine, it's an okay short. After this, we have Pomp and Circumstance, a Donald Duck version of Noah's Ark, and it is so, so lame. Once again, it's this very flat, literal sequence, watching Donald Duck collect animals and be sad because he doesn't think his wife is on the Ark, and none of it works for me. It feels kinda weird to judge the music choices of a Fantasia film, but I also just don't understand why I'm listening to Pomp and Circumstance here. It feels uniquely stodgy and undynamic, and there's nothing about the short that makes me feel anything else. I didn't mention this, but the Donald Duck cartoon comes right after The Sorcerer's Apprentice, the one recycled short from the original Fantasia. And the juxtaposition between these two Disney character-led animations feels both intentional and tragic. Sorcerer's Apprentice, itself the most literal segment of the original film, is this evocative and brilliant masterpiece. The section of that cartoon where Mickey fantasizes about being like his master, controlling the universe, feels huge and emotionally resonant and deep. But this duck sequence almost feels dedicated to not capturing the darkness and scope of its original source material, Noah's Ark. Instead, it just kind of feels like a nursery rhyme version of the original story, and that's sad to me. Here we come to the last short, The Firebird Suite. And while this piece is by no means the worst in the film, I think it expresses perfectly where Fantasia 2000 fails for me. This short is, very obviously, the movie's attempt to reproduce the closing segment of the original Fantasia, Night on Bald Mountain and Ave Maria. And everything about it should work. 
The Firebird Symphony is great, and the animation is beautiful, the most beautiful Fantasia 2000 has to offer. And yet, it doesn't. The Night on Bald Mountain section of the original film brims with this sense of intensity and seriousness and earnest, uncompromising religiosity. For whatever reason, this devil truly feels like an embodiment of evil, and the world he is destroying feels important, sacred. And this new take on it, this new story about death and rebirth for the climax of the film, it feels like nothing. It's sterile somehow, unexpressive, cute, literal, kind of boring. That's the thing about Fantasia 2000, and the reason I have trouble thinking and writing about it. Because when I remember this movie, I think about these birds and these whales with the goofy eyes. Sequences that are not perfect, that don't exactly succeed, but which are nonetheless interesting. I want Fantasia 2000 to be this strange experience, to embody this moment at the turn of the century where we didn't know what computer animation would look like. I want to remember the movie as this mixed, sometimes bad experiment. But when you actually watch it, that's not what it feels like. No, it feels safe, it feels overly clean and kind of unambitious. I want to think that the problem with Fantasia 2000 is its janky CGI animation, but it's not. The problem is the things they tried to create with it. Anyway, for all that, Fantasia 2000 is an S-tier sequel. It's a good one. I mean, I do like it. I, I do, I'm just hard on it. It cost $80 million to create. I think we should be a little hard on it and think about it critically. But it is, you know, it has its moments. It's good. I don't, I don't know. But it's not, it, you know, it's not very good. So, ever since I was a kid, one of my biggest animated movie pet peeves was the goofy comic relief bird character. Little Mermaid has perhaps the most iconic goofy comic relief bird character, but they are everywhere. This is special. This is very, very unusual. What? What is it? It's a dingle hop. Finding Nemo has a goofy comic relief bird character. Secret of Nim has a goofy comic relief bird character. Thumbelina has a goofy comic relief bird character so annoying that we get to watch our protagonist weep because she wants him to leave her alone. Remember, don't. Stop! Stop it, One of my favorite animated scenes ever, honestly. Me too, Thumbelina. These characters always just drop into the movie. They take enormous amounts of time. They're not funny. I almost never find their wacky bird moments funny. You've been using the Dinglehopper, right? I don't like them, is my point. They don't appeal to me. Anyway, uh, Rescuers Down Under is a pretty good movie. I like parts of it. I like the first five minutes of it quite a lot. <laughs> but it does, in fact, have a goofy comic relief bird character. One that's extremely annoying. One that takes up far, far too much of the movie. Blood blowing up to the head. And a couple of these. Oh! Okay, one's enough. Uh, and I hate this man. His name is Wilbur, and he upsets me. When are we gonna move on from the bird character? I think to myself as I watch Rescuers Down Under. When are we gonna drop the bird and get to some serious mouse business? But, uh, we don't. We never do. He's just always around. If Beauty and the Beast, The Enchanted Christmas, made the relationship between Belle and the Beast feel horrible and sad and unreciprocal, then Belle's Magical World, the following sequel, makes their relationship genuinely unwatchable. Like many of these movies, the film is broken into three cartoons, and in the first and third cartoon, Beast is one of the most horrible characters I have ever seen put on screen. In the first cartoon, the Beast opens up a window and then screams at Belle for wanting it closed because it's too cold. I don't have to be con... con you, well, it's my castle, and I make the rules. The entire plot then surrounds how Belle should have apologized to him faster for calling him rude. You want me to apologize? To him? I suppose I do owe him an apology. For calling him rude, I mean. The third cartoon is about Belle finding a wounded bird. The Beast has banned all living creatures from his kingdom, and everyone's worried about how he'll punish them if they're found caring for it. Oh my, oh my, oh my. 
doesn't care for animals much. But then, the beast likes the bird and decides to keep him in a cage and force him to sing. Why won't you sing for me? You're staying in my castle, the least you can do is sing! It's so shockingly awful that it almost verges into the parodic. You can't keep him in a cage, he needs to be free! He is free! To sing for me. There's one scene in this film that I really have to emphasize too, and I'll just play it now. You're having lunch with me! Am I? You are. I am not. <laughs> Perhaps the master might be a bit more gracious. Why should I? Perhaps you will join me for lunch, if you have no other plans. I hardly have plans, but since you put it that way, I accept. I have to remind you, these characters are supposed to be in love. They're supposed to be discovering that they have feelings for each other. And in this moment, the movie seems to genuinely forget about this basic fact. This is how a mother treats her awful abusive son, not how you treat the honking sexy beast boy that you'll one day have sex with. Well, you berated me, but then you asked nicely, so I'll give you a little kiss. Awful, awful stuff. You were supposed to eat with me! Anyway, uh, the second cartoon is about Lumiere and his girlfriend, and I honestly don't have much to say about it. I'm confused by the fact that Lumiere is canonically a cheater in this movie. Like, in the first cartoon, it seems like he's gonna date this chandelier. We do work well together, don't we? But then, in the second, he's back with Fifi. It's very odd. It is the fifth anniversary of my first date with Mon Cher Lumiere. Besides that, I like this French horn, and I like this bath who doesn't have control over its big bath body. I want to see more of him, actually. Uh, thank you. I've already made a video about Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. It's better than the Frozen 2 video, too, so, you know, you can enjoy that. Normally, I'd find something to say about these movies that I already talked about, but I gotta be honest with you, after watching around 30 Disney sequels, I am willing to do whatever it takes to not watch another Disney sequel. Obviously, Lion King 2 slaps, you already know that. It's good, and everyone's talking about it. Don't waste your time with me, uh, just enjoy Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. So, Hercules Zero to Hero was actually really hard for me to get my hands on. Essentially, it's just three episodes of the Hercules cartoon pasted together with a loose framing device, and so Disney saw no reason to preserve it in film form. Now let's see, Hercules, Hercules... <laughs> the movie still exists on VHS, that's the only way to watch it, but I don't have a VHS player or a way to convert VHS to digital, so what I did was buy a copy of Hercules Zero to Hero and send it to my friend Dan Olson. It's true. It's mine now. He converted it, it seemed like a really hard process because the quality of the tape was so low, and then finally he got it to me. So it's not in perfect condition, but now I can proudly say I've seen Hercules Zero to Hero. Um, uh, and it's fine. It's the, sh it's the, it's the cartoon. You can watch the cartoon. You can, you can watch the cartoon. It has, it's like three minutes of framing device around episodes of a cartoon you can watch. The cartoon is, uh, pretty good. I don't mind it. I don't mind the cartoon, I feel kind of silly in the end, uh, putting so much time and calling in a favor from a friend to get Hercules Zero to Hero. I feel a bit uh, 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 silly, but it's fine. I like Cassandra. I think Cassandra's uh, design is really fun. I like the way Cassandra looks. Okay, uh, let me just bang out all my thoughts on the three Lilo and Stitch sequels at once, because what I have to say is very simple. A Lilo and Stitch movie is good proportional to how much Lilo it has. Lilo is one of my favorite Disney characters ever. I love her design, I love her voice actress, I love that she's at times really annoying and selfish like a real little girl. What if I forget the moves? And Myrtle laughs at me, and I get mad, and, and pound her! I like Stitch fine, he's a cute little guy, but to be honest, I'm more interested in Stitch helping to tell a story about Lilo dealing with real life situations than Lilo helping to tell a story about Stitch's alien situations. And this fundamental truth informs my thought on every one of these movies. The first sequel, Stitch Has a Glitch, rules. 
It's mostly about Lilo coming up with a good hula dance for a May Day celebration, and that's the kind of story that Lilo and Stitch is best at telling. I'm not going to say it's as good as the original movie was, but it scratches a similar itch, and I think it's by far the best Disney sequel. S-tier sequel, this one. I promise there won't be any trouble. I promise, promise. The next sequel, Stitch the Movie, is fine. It's a setup for the show, where the team goes around finding different Stitch experiments, and that show is pretty good, so it gets a pass. The movie doesn't center Lilo, it's not all about her, but she's still really important to the themes and plot of the movie, a uh, B-tier B sequel. What are we gonna do? The third sequel, Leroy and Stitch, is, I think, kind of unwatchable. Like, the movie is utterly bored by its main characters. Lilo only has a few real scenes, and oddly enough, Stitch has a fairly minor role too. The movie is, like, mostly about its villain, this hamster guy, and I'm gonna be honest, I find him annoying. I found him annoying in the last movie, and I find him annoying in this one. Oh, good idea! More evil is good! I don't think his running gag where he yells about how to pronounce his name is funny. It is pronounced Hamsterville. I don't care about that. I don't care what this sort of evil creature is named. And I don't like his dumb voice. I will say, though, that I really enjoy seeing all the Stitch experiments in one place. They're so fun. I wonder what they got in store for us. Look at this crab Stitch. What an incredible specimen he is. You know, waddling around. Where's he going to, you know what I mean? What's he up to? What's he trying to pursue in life? Could, could we see a little more of the crab stitch, please? So, there's two very good things in Tarzan 2. The first is Phil Collins' music, which bangs so hard that it's honestly unreal. It might be better if I just the movie is about child Tarzan not feeling like he belongs in his jungle society, and the songs lend this plot a kind of goth gravitas that truly cannot be overstated. Why do I hurt the ones I love with everything I do? Why do I hurt the ones I love? With everything I do. He fucking gets it, man. He's he's living it. He's living it. Bill Collins was obviously going through something when he wrote this, uh, and that's beautiful to me. The other thing I like about the movie is this one scene where Tarzan makes his elderly friend a nest. I made you a nest. You made this? For me? Sure, for your old bones. Like your mom used to make. Try it out. Thank you, Tarzan. Ever since my mommy died, I've simply been sleeping in my own shit and fecal matter, so this really means the world to me. I never thought to sleep in a bed before you came along. I don't know, man. I think it's a good scene. <laughs> So that's all the Disney sequels right there. At least all the Disney sequels I watched. I feel like I must be missing one or two, but I, I don't know, man. I don't know. Anyway, I know what you're thinking. Sure, that video was long, but even after watching it, I can't help but crave more content. There's something deeply wrong with me. What's wrong with me? Am I broken? Well, I have this to say. Uh, don't even worry about all that stuff. If you want to watch more content, head on over to my Nebula. Every month I make a bonus video there, so at this point, I have a million, and this month, I talk about posts on the subreddit Am I the Asshole that I thought were interesting. I'm not the only one who makes content for Nebula. Jacob Geller has bonus content there, Philosophy Tube has her play there, Lindsay Ellis exclusively makes videos for Nebula, and there's one about Guy Fieri that rocks. Nebula costs $30 for the whole year, which I think is a decent price, and people seem to enjoy their subscriptions. At any rate, Nebula's cool, it's a great way to support my channel, so if you're interested, sign up now at the link in the description. So that's the end of the video. I hope you liked it. It was a long one. It was really, really fun for me to make. If you did like it, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, and if you really liked it, give me money on Patreon. That's the other way to access my bonus videos. Anyway, now it's time for my Patreon question of the video. Noah asks, do you speak any other languages or want to learn another language? Uh, no, I don't speak any other languages, but I'm trying to learn French. Je voudrais apprendre le français. Uh, J'apprends le français avec duo. Uh, je prends un cours de français. Uh, je, suis, je suis très bien à le français. Le français est très difficile, mais je suis un homme très intelligent et 
j'apprends le français, j'apprends le français. <rire>